Welcome back new Darktable user. In the last video we looked at the seven utility modules that I think a new user needs to wrap their head around and in this video we're going to look at the 10 image processing modules that you probably want to come to terms with so that you can get started processing your images. Let's go. Hi and welcome to episode 129 of Understanding Darktable. So, the 10 image processing modules that I feel you should get your head around. We're going to start with number one, white balance. There's an interesting thing with white balance. You're probably familiar with the idea of a white balance module, if, certainly if you've come from Lightroom or Capture One or any other raw processing engine. It's designed to help you get the right white balance for your raw data so that you can then go ahead and process your image. Now Darktable has always had a white balance module, but it now also has a module called color calibration. And color calibration and white balance, they're like stepbrother, stepsister. They're related uh, and it's a little bit too complicated for me to go into all of the detail in this video because we'll end up being here for an hour and I don't want to do that. For the moment, let's just take a look at the white balance module. You will see that you've got four icons across the top. Set the white balance to as shot. So in other words, as shot in camera. Set the white balance to detected from area. So that puts this white bounding box around the majority of your image and you can left click and drag to draw a rectangle over any part of your image, large or small, in order to say, I wanna take a white balance reading from that particular area. Now, right now you're looking at this image and going, why are the colors so messed up? That is because of the color calibration module. And you will notice down here in the white balance module, white balance applied twice. That is because the color calibration module, which we are going to get to, also handles white balance, but it does it slightly differently and it does it at a different stage of what's called the pixel pipe. And this is something I'd not heard of until I came to Darktable. The pixel pipe refers to the order in which Darktable applies the processing of every module between input and output. And Darktable's order of processing is not the same as the order in which you turn on certain modules. Okay, so just to, already I feel like I'm going in circles. Just trust me here, if we turn the color calibration module off, you'll see that there's also a red triangle on the color calibration module. Uh, this little power icon, by the way, shows you all the modules that are currently active, and the pixel pipe runs from bottom to top of the active module group. So this is the order in which Darktable will process all of the modules in your image. And that group will change from image to image because Sometimes you'll use one module and you won't use other modules. So let's just turn off the color calibration module. Now the white balance module can actually do its thing. And we notice that the white balance has now corrected itself. So like I said, you can choose a small or a large area from which to take a reading to say, I want to use this as my white balance reading. Next is custom white balance, so user modified, and this gives you temperature and tint. So if you've come from Lightroom, this probably makes a whole lot of sense because you can just adjust the temperature and you can adjust the green magenta tint as you see fit. The last one here is set white balance to camera referred or referenced, yeah, reference point. Uh, in most cases, it should be D65. This is the option you choose if you are going to use the color calibration module. Now, why would you use the color calibration module? I hear you ask. Well, remember I was talking about the pixel pipe and the order in which things are done. Notice that the white balance happens in second place, right after the setting of the raw 
black and white points for the raw data. But you'll notice that white balance happens prior to demosaicing. And for that reason, we cannot have two instances of the white balance module. Now, you're probably thinking, well, why would I want that? Well, because there are times when you'll shoot an image with mixed color sources of light. You know, you might have fluorescent light on one side of the image and tungsten light on the other. And so you want to mix and match white balances in order to create a nice to balance look to that image. Now, OK, yes, that's a bit of a niche example, but there are times when you want to do that. And there are other reasons for using the color calibration module. I, again, have done a separate video on the color calibration module. So go and check that out if you want to dive deeper into the weeds there. So white balance. D65, if you are going to use the color calibration module, if you are not, if you are going to choose one of these other three, make sure you turn off the color calibration module. I feel like I've sort of covered both one and two now because number one was white balance and number two was the color calibration module. So let's just call that one and two done. Number three is the exposure module. Shouldn't need any explaining. It allows you to boost or reduce the exposure on your image, as you would expect. It will also allow you to choose a black level correction. I have not, in my time of using Darktable, I've probably processed about, I don't know, 10,000 images. I have not once ever reached for that black level correction slider in the exposure module. That's number three, exposure. Number four is the tone equalizer. And this is quite a complicated module to understand. It was designed to be a replacement for the curves module, of which there are about three. Uh, <laughs> but I don't feel like it's user friendly, particularly not to a new user. But I do know that the people who have spent plenty of time with Darktable myself excluded, seem to love it. I don't, but I have done a dedicated video on it. So if you want to understand how to use it, it's not just as simple as doing something like that. You might think it is that simple, but there is more to it. So definitely go and watch the video on the tone equalizer if you really want to get the most out of it. But it is designed to allow you to manipulate the tone mapping of your image. That's number four, the tone equalizer. Number five is the RGB curve, which is the module that the tone equalizer was primarily designed to replace. Why? Not entirely sure. I think part of it was to do with the whole display referred versus scene referred editing argument. And again, I've done a whole video on that subject. So if those terms mean nothing to you, definitely go and check that out. But again, you can turn this on and you can dial in a tone curve as you see fit. If you want to reduce contrast, go that way. Reset. There we go. Again, there's a whole bunch more to that module. There are more parameters that you can look at and different interpolation methods. And again, I've done a video on that. So feel free to go and check that out if you want. But if the tone equalizer module leaves you scratching your head, Default to the RGB curve. But RGB curve, base curve, and tone curve are three different curve modules that are available to you. I would say if you want to use a curve, use the RGB curve. All right, that's number five, the RGB curve. Number six is the color balance RGB module. Now, this can look overwhelming because when you open it up, it takes up pretty much the full height of your sidebar on a 1920 by 1080 display. And there are three tabs as well. Again, I've already done a dedicated video on this, but the basics are contrast slider, if you want some contrast, hue shift, if you need to muck around with the hue, you would only do that after having correctly set your white balance. If you wanted to do something creative, you've got vibrance controls, and then you have linear chroma grading, perceptual saturation grading, and perceptual brilliance grading. These 12 sliders 
basically replace the contrast brightness saturation module which I would urge you to avoid again because of the display referred versus scene referred editing. Blah, 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 blah. The only reason there are 12 sliders is because each of them is broken up into four sections, a shadows, midtones, and highlights, as well as a global control. So if you just want to affect, say, the saturation of your highlights, you can do something like that. If you just want to affect the shadows, you might want to desaturate your shadows. You can do it that way. If you don't want to do that, you just want to affect saturation globally for the entire image, then you just use the global saturation slider. Again, a whole lot more to that module, but this is the module that you will use in place of contrast, brightness, and saturation. And because of the contrast slider, you can also use it as a contrast module as well, if you like. So that's number six, the Color Balance RGB module. Number seven is Sigmoid. This is a module which was introduced with Darktable 4.2, and it's working in competition against the Filmic RGB module. They were developed by two separate developers uh, who don't see eye to eye on the process for adding contrast to an image. So Sigmoid is one way, Filmic RGB is another. I haven't done a dedicated video on the Sigmoid module, and I have to confess, I've had mixed results with it. You can dial in contrast as you see fit with the contrast slider. Altering the skew will shift the skew of the contrast towards either the highlights or the shadows, uh, and you can process either per channel or on an RGB ratio and I do find that the RGB ratio tends to offer less of a color shift than the per channel mode. All right that's number seven Sigmoid. Number eight is Sigmoid's nemesis the Filmic RGB module. Now Filmic RGB is designed to quickly allow you to set a white and a black point for your image with the white relative exposure and the black relative exposure sliders. Now, yes, you can use the sliders, but I actually think the quicker way is to just use the eyedropper. So click once to set the white point, click on the black relative slider eyedropper to set the black point, and then click on that again to get out of that tool. This has immediately set the optimum white and black point for your image, and you will notice that the histogram now reflects that distribution. You have a histogram that stretches the full width. Again, there is a whole lot more to the Filmic RGB module. Yes, I did do a video on Filmic way, way, way back in the dark ages, probably three, maybe four years ago now, I really do need to do a new version of that video because there is a lot to dive into with the Filmic RGB module, but I do find it to be a very powerful tool when used properly. That is number eight, Filmic RGB. Number nine is local contrast. If you have come from the world of Adobe's Lightroom, you would be wondering, where on earth is my clarity slider? Well, that, my friends, in Darktable is called local contrast. So we can just search in here for local contrast, and there it is. And you can dial in as much or as little local contrast as you like. Choose to accentuate highlights or shadows and mid-tone range, etc., etc. Again, I've done a video on that a long time ago, but it should still be relevant because I don't think anything has actually changed in that module since I did it. So that is number nine, the local contrast module. And number 10 is the monochrome module. Now, I've included this even though within the color balance RGB module, I could use a value of minus 100 for global saturation and achieve a monochrome effect. But if for some reason you wanted to use the monochrome module, you can. And what it has as a nice little sort of tweak on the idea of a monochrome module is the ability to shift the monochrome 
according to the color distribution in the original image. So if we click on the blues, that changes what happens compared to if we click on the reds. There's probably a whole lot more documentation on that in the uh, online manual for Darktable. Uh, I think I covered that when I did the video on the monochrome module years and years and years ago, uh, but I don't even remember it myself because these days I tend not to use the monochrome module. I tend to just go into color balance RGB and go saturation minus 100 and then go and find a, a curve tool to give it some steeper curves and contrast and off you go. So that is it. That's number 10, the monochrome module. And that, dear new Darktable user, is my list of the 10 image processing modules that I think you probably want to wrap your head around to get started. Before I go, uh, it has been a long time between drinks and my apologies for that. I'm finding that I just, I get home after work and I am just absolutely done. By the time we've had dinner, the last thing I can fathom is coming here and recording a video, which is a little bit sad. Also wanted to mention, Kath and I are going to Alaska in September. Do I have any viewers in Alaska? Sing out if you're from that neck of the woods. We're going to be in Anchorage and Fairbanks and a few spots in between. So tell Keatner, Denali. Yeah, looking forward to it. Anyway, we're going to do a three-week trip. Uh, we're only going to be sort of on the mainland in Alaska for, uh, I think it's about a week and a half. But um, yeah, if any of you from up that neck of the woods, sing out, say good day. Um, might pick your brains on how best to shoot the, uh, the northern lights. I know March is better than September, but I've been led to believe that March and September around your two equinoxes are kind of the prime viewing opportunities for the northern lights. So I'm hoping things will be spectacular. Uh, I don't think they're going to be as spectacular as they were a week ago. Uh, I'm recording this on the 30th of March and about yeah five days ago there was just this massive coronal mass ejection from the sun and the auroras just went off. I saw things on my feed from people as far south I think Colorado and Iowa were seeing the northern lights and for the Aurora Australis, which is the Southern Lights, um, which it, it's interesting. I've never shot the Southern Lights either. Um, I've, I've never even seen them, even though I lived in Tasmania for a while. Um, but we get different colors to what the Northern Lights get. The Northern Lights tend to always be green and occasionally with some purple, uh, sort of a magenta-ish purple where here in Australia and certainly down in Tasmania, if you get to see the Aurora Australis, it tends to be more red and, oh, I've suddenly blanked on what the other color is. But anyway, they're different to the Northern Lights. So yeah, go figure. So anyway, looking forward to it. Three weeks, it's gonna be chilly, I know. I know that the locals won't think that it's chilly because it'll be their, it'll be your fall, as you call it, uh, what we call autumn. Uh, so that'll be nice because there'll be all the, the lovely colours of the leaves turning, which will just be spectacular. Just hope that we get some, some sunny days there while, while, while we're there. So anyway, something to look forward to, more shooting opportunities. All right, I will leave it there. Uh, questions, comments, sing out down below and I will catch you in the next one.